Hi guys, welcome to the Simple Doesn't Mean Easy podcast. We are here every Monday and Friday working at simplifying things in our lives one day at a time. I'm your host, Michelle Visser, and today I think you're gonna love my talk with my friend Stacy Lynn Harris. Before I bring you into that conversation. I want to tell you, you can actually get a copy of her book. It's absolutely gorgeous. The food is amazing. Love language of the South by Stacey Lynn Harris. One person who leaves a review over on Apple podcasts, you can leave a review about this episode itself or just the podcast in general. One person will be chosen and notified in the next couple of weeks to win a copy of this gorgeous book. So please go leave a review, go to solelyrested.com slash podcast. If you would like some help, some directions, some links on how you do that, but trust me, it's super, super easy. Okay. Also one more thing. Don't forget about solelyrested.com slash free and the amazing real ingredients gift away that is going on this entire month. Go to that page, enter every single day. And I really I'm excited about it because our goal is to give back in a truly meaningful way to you guys to ease that sometimes like that overwhelm that you can feel when you realize you can't do it all. Um, I'm all about baby steps and I'm all about just doing the night next right thing on your journey towards, um, helping your family lead a healthier life. But I'm also all about gifting to some folks in some amazing ways to help on that journey when I can. So go to solelyrested.com slash free. All right, Stacy, I'm so excited that you took some time today to sit down and chat with me. I've actually been looking forward to this for a while since we first got it on our calendars. Yes. Um, let me tell everybody who's listening. Stacy Lynn Harris is the host of the Sporting Chef TV show. She is a best-selling author of a whole slew of cookbooks. Is it five now? Um. Did I lose count? It's four. <laughs> I don't know. It's okay. Count a handbook as, as a book, but sort of. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. And she's a well-known speaker and she's basically showing the world that Southern culture is way more than just sweet iced tea. Cause I think a lot of people, when they think mm -hmm. of the South, that's the first thing we think of. Oh, sweet iced tea, but it is so much more. Yes. And yes. you have definitely shown the world that. So you're quite a spokesperson for oh, Southern, wow. Southern living and delicious Southern food. <laughs> and the book, by the way, is gorgeous. Stacy's oh, brand new you. book. I was so tickled, Stacy, when you reached out and you seriously asked me to write you an endorsement. I'm like, are you yes. kidding? Yes. Please, please, please send the book over. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited and you did such a beautiful job of that. And I hope that you like the book. I thought that the publishing company did a great job. I did not know what the product was going to end up looking like. And I feel like they just totally got the message. Yes. It's it hard, great. isn't it? As an author that you're kind of just handing over your baby, your yes. hard work, and you're kind of going, yes. I think they know what I want them to do with it. But <laughs> yes, <And so laughs> but I agree with you. Yeah. It's gorgeous. And it's like, it's perfect for someone like me who, okay, I'm not actually a Southerner, but people here in New England, when we moved here a decade ago, all have dubbed us Southerners because we're from Delaware, which when you're in New Hampshire, oh God. that's way South. <laughs> and then they get really disappointed when I tell them, actually, we lived above the Mason Dixon line, guys. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, but funny. The truth is my mom and dad both grew up in rural West Virginia in the panhandle okay. where during the depression and I absolutely feel like a Southern girl at heart. So you are a Southern girl at heart. You are like <laughs> totally um, kind and hospitable and everything oh. that encompasses what I think of as the South. It's changed a good bit, but it, it's still there. Um, wow. and I'm just going to like put that on a plaque in my yeah. office or something that Stacey yeah. Lynn Harris yeah. thinks that yeah. I'm an epitome of a Southern girl. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, that's a huge compliment. Um, but I forget where I was going. Something about the South and I don't know, but your book is absolutely gorgeous. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I grew up on stories. I mean, my dad was a true Southerner story boy at heart. Like he would sit down, lean back, cross his legs and talk mm. for hours, whether anybody wanted to listen or not, you know? <laughs> I love that. I love that. 
Yeah. And so I love stories. I would like I'm, to I, I was a professional storyteller for 15 years before I moved to New England. And I just absolutely am enamored with hearing a good story, telling a good story, and reading a good story. And the reason I'm saying all this is your cookbook is not really just a cookbook. It is literally stories of the South and mm-hmm. stories of your family. And I absolutely love that about it. So well, you put a you. lot into this. A lot. I did. I did. <laughs> and and towards the end, I was sitting in my room because it was due. And I'm like, I still have like, I don't know how many stories left. And I knew what I was going to write because all of the, the um, recipes, they either dictated the story or either the story itself dictated the recipe. Because here in the South, everything we do is around food. Everywhere we go, food is, it is part of it. So when I had a memory, the food would come up. When I had the, the, you know, or if there was a special food, there's always a memory involved. And so they kind of went hand in hand. So I knew from the beginning, you know, what stories I did. I was like, what order am I going to put this in? I don't know. Um, yeah. But I knew what the stories would be. And that, well, now I forgot where I was going with that. You had mentioned something. I know oh, what you mean. You and I both. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's the problem. Okay. When two right. friends sit down to just talk, we you both kind of lose track. But the, oh, I remember. Okay. So, but the very end, I was like, I've got to finish these stories. And I, I would walk out of the room. I'm in my like, you know, sweat clothes looking all terrible. And I'm like, oh, I can't do this anymore. And, you know, because it's a, it's a hard to convey your emotion in the story, whether it be funny, whether it be sad, to make sure that the people feel what you're saying is not yeah. really that easy to do. And and, and I, I was like, I'm hoping that I'm a better storyteller. I hope I'm a better writer, you know, now that I have written this. But it was a true adventure. I had so much fun writing this book. It, it was unreal. Yeah. 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 I mean, honestly, it's almost a memoir. It is. It is. Yeah. Well, I had meant for it to be a memoir. And then I thought, well, is my audience ready for that? I don't know. <laughs> you know, you know, you're powerful. I, 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 don't I know. am with you. I think your audience is, but I don't think, yeah, but I'm with you. <laughs> it's because I'm kind of like, I don't know about it. I don't know yet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I changed Okay. So it. I have another question for you. Yeah. After it was already like on its way to literally be printed, did you yes. have a moment like I did with my book? Because I mean, my book is just about making sugar, you know, it's yeah. sugar making. But I did the same thing. I threw in the stories and yeah. I put like my heart into it, yes. you know? Yes. And I had this moment. I remember it one day when it was on its way to get printed. I, I was really nervous and I thought, it's it's like, out, I, it's out there. I yeah. can't, it's done. You can't pull any of that me. back. That's like, yeah. I took my heart and I opened it up a little bit there and it's like forever out there. Did you have that moment? Yes, I did. And, and because of, because of people are in my book, it's not just about me. Yes. But I yes. To I got to know, is Mr. Jackson going to read this book? Was that his name? Yes. Yeah, so you <laughs> totally read my kill him with kindness chapter. Yes. And, I did read that story. Yes. And, and I did not change his name. But anyway, it was just kind of interesting, but I don't think he's alive anymore. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> I tried to make sure, you know, like different. And things. you didn't give his first name or his social security number. So I no, mean, and, and, Jack, <laughs> and so, um, you know, his kids might read it, yeah. but it's okay. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so people, but yeah, like my, 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 well, my mom, there was a couple of things cause she's very private. But mm. how can I write a Southern book without bringing into it the Southern people, the Southern women, you know, that influenced me in my life? I had to put her Absolutely. in here and I, and part of my story had to do with her. So she had yeah. to be in it. And I did not share any of the stories with her until I had written them all the way okay. I wanted to write them. And then I did, but then I forgot a few things. And so she's told me recently, well, I'm really nervous about this part. And I, so I read it to her and, um, she said, okay, okay, I can live with that. (laughs) And so, but it's like, and then I worry about like, you know, my dad was in Vietnam. He did come back changed. It, I, I had to put my perspective in there of how, how that affected the, really the trajectory, the trajectory of our lives and, 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 you know, in his life. And I, I don't know, you know, what he'll think of that, but I think he'll be okay with that. I mean, it is, it is history. It is, 
what happened and people need to know, you know, people do yeah. know, you know, people now are talking about, about Vietnam and about P- PTSD and people understand, you know, the trauma and, and the bad, um, the really to me, just the evil of people, you know, you're fighting for a nation. Maybe you don't agree with the fighting. Maybe they didn't even know what they were fighting about. And actually my dad's been in a several books. Um, and it's, they don't know what, they didn't even know what they were fighting about. They, they're like, what is this even about? But they were doing for their country what right. they had to do. And then they come back and then people are upset with them. And, you know, in any way, it, it was really traumatic. And, you know, yeah. he lost everybody out of his platoon except a few in one particular fight. And then he was a pretty much a hero in the book that was written. And and I, I'm hoping that that brought up a lot of healing to him. To me, it brought a lot of healing. And so anyway, yeah. but I talk about that and I talk about, you know, my granny's kitchen and how it brought healing, which is mm-hmm. what hospitality is all about, um, yeah. is to nurture, to bring healing. It has nothing to do really with entertaining. Um, it has yeah. to, it, it's about meeting needs and um, knowing what needs are there to be met? It's being very perceptive. Um, mm-hmm. And it's about opening yourself to either listening, to giving advice, to um, to feeding the soul, nourishing the soul, the body. It, it's, it's really being a hospital for people. And that's what my granny's kitchen was to me. And that's, that was about what that chapter was about. Hey guys, let's take a quick pause. And talk about dandelion leaves. Sounds weird, right? But they're amazing. Did you know that a dandelion leaf is a really versatile herb with high levels of iron and calcium and vitamin A and C and K? And the leaves are loaded with potassium salts and antioxidants. And yet, the taste is quite mild. Why am I telling you this? Because today's episode is sponsored by Positively Botanicals. And I love so many things that I pick up from them. And dandelion leaf is the one that I was using this morning. So it was fresh in my mind. So I thought I'd tell you about it. But if you want to go check out solelyrested.com slash teas, T-E-A-S, if you scroll near the bottom, I share my absolute favorite botanicals that I love buying from them. And there's also, of course, a coupon code listed there and links. So please go check it out, solelyrested.com slash teas, and give some love to this amazing company that I seriously am excited to tell you more about in future episodes, solelyrested.com slash T-E-A-S. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I mean, that's the reason I wanted to bring you on specifically. I mean, I'll talk to you anytime about anything, but, yes, <laughs> but today yes. specifically, I really wanted to talk about the importance of the family table because your yes. book goes into that in great detail and you're, you're getting there right now with what you're saying about your grandmother. But the fact, I mean, today... I think it's so alarming that people don't gather around the table. They might go, you might not believe this, but in reality, some families might go a week or two and never join together around the table for a meal. And I'm pretty certain that's not the way your family is, (laughs) especially after reading the book. So, I mean, let's talk about this. What do you, it's, it's a real problem. What do you think's happening? And what are, what are the families missing because they're not doing this? I think that the family is so separated out. I think that that's the problem is that, you know, really I I go back to Darwin and I feel like, (laughs) I feel like the Darwinian age started segregating um, intergenerational people. I, I think, you know, kids would be with kids and, and because it's like, well, that's what they want to do. That's their mental capacity. The adults would stay with the adults. The older generation would stay with themselves. And, and instead of coming together, everybody is like got their own Sunday school classes, got their own, you know, um, grade in school. Um, there's no, there's no uh, bigger kids helping the younger kids. And so there's not any relationship and and then people now, are I think a lot of that started well, around two different things. First of all, the whole industrial age, all yes, of a sudden. Yes. You know, families were no longer farming yes, agriculture. They yes. were all moving to the cities. Um, and I think that destroyed the families. And second of all, I think uh, public education. Yes. All of a sudden. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was people mm-hmm. don't realize that's still mm-hmm. relatively new to our nation. Mm-hmm. And it is. Until that happened, 
kids were learning side by side with all ages of people, you know, yes. you and I being homeschoolers yeah. forever, homeschool yes. moms forever, you know, yes. we, we have a passionate stance on this. <laughs> yes. And, um, and I'm not but what do you mean about Darwin? You lost me when you mentioned Darwin. Well, just, um, pretty much that you couldn't, you could only, you, you, it can only function if you look at the school and, and the philosophy at the time, um, Darwin, you, you, you're, you would, you could only be around the people. Um, and I won't say you could only be around them, but you know, it's like the people that were of the same caliber mind set. And so that's why I was like, everybody had to have their separate groups. Like, like, so you're saying that like the mentality started classifying people more. Yes. Yes. Okay. So before we had this classification system in science, yes, even in our relations with people, we didn't really break down. That's a good point. Okay. And, That's a good um, point. I've always thought of it around the farm, you know, and like I said, and when yes. people moved away from farming, how that impacted relations generationally. But that's an interesting thought, the way you just said. Okay. Um, um, and, and, you know, I, there's there's more to say about all that, but I know that that's not what we're talking about really. But but anyway, I think that it had to do, and then that's when the school, you know, started putting first grade or second, third, fourth, and that, you know, you, you couldn't learn among Every, everyone, it just is stopped. It, it, the, gen, the intergenerational relationships just kind of, you know, came to a halt. And then everybody's got their own separate, like this one's ballet, this one's football. And people yeah. started putting sports and making the family kid centric, which also s- started mm-hmm. making the family unit smaller because there's no way that you can have ki- a, a child centric home and have more than like maybe three kids. I mean, how could you Mm. can't spread yourself that thin? So Mm. it needs to be, you know, at least for us. And this is one thing that, you know, somebody would probably disagree with me. And I know that there has to be balance, but they came alongside of us. We, you know, participated in creating them. Of course, you know, God is the creator, but they came along the side of us and, um, and, and became who they are through what we did. And, and they developed their own talents. They developed their own skills, oh, their own desires. It ended with, they became who they are. Yes. Through the experiences with us. And they're very different than us. I mean, they're very much alike, but they're very much different, you know, too. And they, you know, each of them has their own little niche that they picked out kind of from the things that we have done, but we do do a lot. I mean, we build houses and, you know, we renovate, we cook, you know, I do. I mean, the family unit is kind of like an apprenticeship, you know, and what you described sounded like an apprenticeship. My daughter, true story, just sent me, you know, sometimes you get those texts that just warm your heart. My daughter, who's now married, lives back in Delaware (laughs) with her husband, sent me a text of a picture of Johnny Tremaine that she picked up a used copy at a thrift store. And she said, mom, I can't wait to read this again. And I like, my heart got all fuzzy because the last time I read that she was, I don't know, 10 and she had to read it to me that school year. That's great. great. But I mean, that's why I thought of apprenticeship because I was just thinking of Johnny Tremaine. (laughs) But but yeah, that's how the family should work. And it it makes perfect sense. But like you said, we're so busy. Kids are in so many different things, which I think parents think, that's being a good parent, right? We're pushing our kid. We're we're getting yeah. them involved in all kinds of things, but Which is they're good. sacrificing. Yes. It is good. Yes. But you have to you have to have a balance. I mean, I will tell you, my kids, my daughters were all so into softball that we wouldn't eat dinner <laughs> until eight or eight thirty most nights because somebody was at a tournament or a game and we were all busy. Yes. But I they knew. We're not eating until everybody can be here. You know? yes. <laughs> so, yes. So it meant family, really late dinner sometimes. And different families do different things. If that's what your family is about, if you're a sports family, um, right. then, then great. I mean, you know, so I, it, every family has to find their version of, of making this thing happen. And traditions are are a big part of that. Like, um, I have never been a real traditional person and I've always asked the question and tried to get my children to ask the question. Um, like, why am I doing this? And so sometimes I, you know, I can, I see myself as a little bit of a rebel 
you know, a rebel with that. Like, why would I send my children to kindergarten? Why would I, you know, like do, you know, do Mother's Day out? Why not that anything's wrong with any of that? But well, don't to you ask think yourself, when you first became, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no. Don't you think when you first became a homeschool mom, for me, that's when my rebellious streak started. Yeah. Suddenly I, I realized I can yeah. figure out how to do some of these things. I don't have to trust the systems, you know? Yes. yes. And it's a scary thing. You're stepping out there. And I feel like with our generation, with you and I, there weren't that many people homeschooling. I mean, I, I, my, my daughter did a research project trying to figure out something. And anyway, it was like only 10,000 in the United States at that time, which I, I mm. thought there were, I was, you know, one of many. And, and we were like, pioneers in that. And we just stepped out and it was an experiment, but an experiment that a a theory that I had really looked into, I mean, it wasn't just, Oh, I'm going to try. I mean, you know, um, but it was a scary, you know, a scary thing because you don't know you're, you're spending 20 years of, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but I'm following God. This is what he's saying for me to do. So I'm going to do it. Um, yes. But as far do you think that today, this combination of kids being scattered, you know, and so busy. And the fact that people aren't even bothering to come together around the table. Do you think that's, (laughs) I don't mean this to be a pun, but is that feeding into a lot of the problems that we see with kids confused about identity, kids feeling unaccepted, not having a place, not knowing who they really are? Like, don't you think we need that time to connect as a family to really Uh, tell the child, you are accepted here. Yes. This is who you are. You are part of this family. Like we need that, don't you think? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So if children go to school, um, and that's what the the parents decide when they come home, you know, and I I had this passage in the book and it wasn't about this exactly, but leave your baggage at the door, come in and let's just be, and it doesn't have to be forced conversation can happen or not. But, um, but, but we have worked out around the table. We have worked out hiring dilemmas. Cause I, I helped my husband with his office for a long time and it would be like, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know. What do you think? Should I look at this resume more? Should I call this person? In? Y- your kids may not know that they're learning certain things or that they're going to become certain people. But my, like one of my sons, for instance, is running for us Congress. And I think that, you know, us talking about issues around the table made him feel passionate about changing things in in the United States. Um, You know, changing major decisions and issues that affect people's lives. And those kinds of things just can't be, you know, you have to have a particular place a sanctuary where you can discuss these things and around the table with your family is one of those places. And, and just like a kindergartner may come home from kindergarten and discuss the fact that, you know, Oh, I don't know. I, I, you know, I feel more like a a boy today or, you know, whatever. And you, you, because I, you know, I've, I've felt like I, you know, could be a better boy mom than a girl mom because I have all these passions and, you know, I have a lot of initiative and I have a lot of competitiveness and, you know, there's all of these things that I have that I could feel that way. And it makes it easy to say, this is, that's normal. It's normal to feel that way, you know, sometimes, you know, and, and oh, yeah. then the, I have they, a daughter that says all the time, mom, if I was like a kid now, everybody yeah. would be trying to convince me that I was a boy because exactly. she was such a tomboy. Yes. yes. And, and it has okay, so, to do with it. So I agree with you being around the table. Literally, it seems so simple, but it literally can change the world. Sometimes exactly. what happens around the family table. And I know you said you don't have to be around food. I agree with that. Sometimes driving in the car was the deepest conversations we ever had. I think it's because the teen is looking straight ahead and doesn't have to look you in the eyes. Sometimes that leads to deeper <laughs> conversations. So but, but the food gives you this, I don't know, it grounds you more, I feel like. And like you talked about your grandmother's kitchen, like yes. it just soothes you and it comforts you in a way that I think can alter the conversation in ways that other places can't, you know, I know that might sound weird, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Well, you, you get refreshed. One of my sons seems to be, um, he, he really is affected by food and he gets almost like depressed, like, and then he Mm -hmm. eats, he's fine. 
And so I I don't know if it's a low blood sugar situation or what, but it brings healing. You get something to drink. You're, it calms you. You're with people that you, that, that accept and love you. And, you know, you can bring anything up and say, you know, this is really bothering me. Or maybe I want to change majors in school. We had a girl come over the other day, um, uh, after church and she was like, I have to declare my major tomorrow. I don't know what I want to major in. So we all asked her a bunch of questions and we helped her decide. Mm. And it's like, that decision was made, you know, fun. fun. Yeah. So fun. Yeah. And you do say a lot in the book that it really doesn't have to be around the kitchen table. And you talk about going outside, setting up your table out there. Now, as soon as I saw that, though, I thought I got to ask Stacey if she has some tips on this, because, (laughs) you know, if I did that, it would be during black fly season or mosquitoes would eat us alive. So, I mean, give us do you have any tips for eating outdoors? Uh, Because your scenes look gorgeous. And I'm like, I want to do that. (laughs) Yes. Um, well, it did get stifling hot here. And that mm. my chapter um, on the barbecue chicken and 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 the sweet tea and all that stuff and the yeah. lane cake, it was in July, July the 31st. And we were outside. It was so hot. But but yeah, bugs. We had these zappers, these mosquito zappers. But our, oh, our yeah. are abs- they are so huge and they mm-hmm. will suck all the blood out of you. I don't even know how we make it through. <laughs> <laughs> the, the summer and uh, and and they're very bothersome we also have little gnats that bite um you know and and so it's it is annoying but it's worth it because well one we have so many kids and I don't have to worry about cleaning up the kitchen and we always ate too on our porch I have a pretty big front porch mm, we would eat out there yes. or we would take a picnic outside and then I would have a topic that we would talk about and it would be school but you wouldn't feel like school and yes. you know and And one thing that I wanted to say is if you bring one fact to the table every night, that's 365 new facts. And that's a lot of school. So, you know, if you, 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 young moms out there that, you know, didn't get school done that day. um, If you have that, that, you know, is, is going to happen, at least it's going to happen. And, you know, we always made sure we, we did God first and then everything else, you know, would fall into place and, and it, and it works out. It works out. Yeah. And sometimes when we had a difficult lesson or something that nobody really wanted to read, I found that if I made a picnic out of it and we either had lunch or took a nice snack out on a blanket and we got comfy, sometimes that helped just the change of scenery, getting outside and having some good food. Yeah. But food always makes everybody just kind of center and reconnect, you know? (laughs) Yes. And And also um, you you mentioned a few times in the book that, and you've already said it today, that you really don't have to put a lot of effort into this. Yes. Um, I had an author on back in November. His book was called Just Show Up. And that's exactly what we talked about, that sometimes yep. it's just a matter of being there for a person. And you talk about in the book how it's really just a love language of of yeah a little bit of conversation. Yeah. It doesn't have to be entertaining. Yeah. It doesn't have to be fancy. No. Yeah. And no. And I, I think, you know, even like I, w- I was um, saying the other day to someone, but just having like cookies in the freezer that are you have in a log, which is like my cookie recipe. And I'll tell you how to do that. But you slice. I them love bake. that. I think was that in your Southern hospitality chapter, I think that you it talked was. about. Yeah. Yes. And, and that's enough. That is enough. That yeah, tea, sweet tea, coffee, whatever, and just to give something special, and then to make your house smell like cookies. I mean, you know, just even that, yeah. you know, meeting the senses, just meeting those needs in a person, it 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 changes them, and to have them walk away happier than when they came in, that's the goal. And it isn't about a clean house, and it's not about a you know, a a spectacular house. It's not about anything like that. It's just about how you leave that person. Yeah. And I've heard you say, um, time that I spend cooking is time that I spend loving. And I love that because I think a big obstacle for moms when they want to feed their families well is that it's, it's stressful. It can get overwhelming. They can feel a little exhausted by the whole effort sometimes. But if we can remind ourselves it's not just that I'm making this casserole, but I'm loving the people in my life. Yes. Yes. Because I mean, it is in some ways a sacrifice to get in your kitchen and to cook when you really just don't feel like it. You've had a really big day and you get in there 
and you're just like, what am I even going to cook today? I'm, I'm exhausted. I haven't planned anything. And so to think about the people that you're cooking for and to be like, they need this refreshing. And like my boys, I, they need protein. And I'm like, I, you know, I want to, I'm just like, can't we just have a grilled cheese sandwich? Um, and you know, and it's Can't we like, have popcorn oh, and smoothies guys. That's yeah, enough. <laughs> or cereal. Um, yeah. and so can't we just do normal, what normal people do? Um, yeah. but, and, uh, and, but it, it makes a difference. And I'm so glad every time that I've done it, but, but to have some stuff prepared, like, um, I have a white sauce, it's a barbecue sauce that goes great on salads. It goes great on, you know, I have some fried pickles in the book and a couple of other things and it goes great on that, but to have that already in there and to know, okay, I could make, I know this sounds weird, but I could just throw together some pasta and put that white sauce on it and Mm -hmm. get some chicken from a rotisserie chicken and put it together. And it's Mm going to be good. You got one element of homemade or, you know, whatever. And you just kind of make this thing happen. It doesn't have to be beautiful. It doesn't, I'm all about beauty, but just to put something warm on the table, home cooked that they can get it's yeah. very, um, it's very soothing and they do appreciate it. And my, you know, my kids come home for the food. So, um, I think, <laughs> you know, I've got one at Auburn, he called and he said, well, I'm thinking about staying tonight, but what are y'all having for supper? And <laughs> <laughs> I love you, mom, but I really want to know the food. I don't, I don't need to see you if it's not the food that I want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm like, Hmm, what can I say that'll get him here? Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Two questions though about this white sauce. One, do you intentionally make something like that in excess when you make it so that you I have do. it in the fridge? I personally okay. do. Yeah. 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 So I'll make at least double, um, you know, if okay. not double. And actually all of my recipes, I usually double or triple, but you know, most people don't have this Which many. for a family with, if all the six, seven, you have seven kids, yeah. if all the seven kids are over, like yeah. that's a lot if you're doubling or tripling. It's a lot. It's a lot. I know. I mean, Do you have like, any tips for fridge space? Because <laughs> I mean, my fridge is always one. too crowded. Yeah. No, I know. I have two refrigerators <laughs> and three freezers. So, um, because we, we have <laughs> I have three freezers. I didn't know I had this in common with you, but I only have one refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's very necessary you know, for us, because yeah. during deer season too, we age our deer yeah. in our refrigerators. So then I'm like, Oh, they're bringing another deer home and it takes up <laughs> a lot of space. And so, yes, yeah. um, it's yeah. very important. Yeah. So the other question about the white sauce, where can people get this recipe? Have you shared this somewhere? Is that in the book? It's in the book. It's actually, it is. it's in my 4th of July chapter and okay. it's with the, um, smoked chicken recipe. Okay. And so I'm impressed yeah. that you like could tell me exactly where it is even. You go. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So before we wrap this up, do you have any other than I loved the one tip you just gave us about preparing ahead of time, but do you have any other tips for encouraging moms how to get some nutritional meal on the table and to bring the family together as a regular basis as they're able when it just is so hard? Like, can you throw any other tips our way? Um, I, well, the main thing is I try not to go to the grocery store except once a week and I do shop, you know, like at the bigger warehouses or whatever. And I will make sure that I make a list. I have, a uh, you know, the produce you know, me, you know, the whole list and in, in kind of categories. And so I'll look at, um, I will look at the, um, or the recipes that I am interested in doing that week and make sure that I've got like, you know, some peas, some vegetables of some kind, um, everything on the, you know, on my list when I go to the grocery store to make sure that I have what I need to make healthy meals. So then I will make them like the, on the weekend and make sure that I have like my meat thawed out, um, go ahead and cook the meat. Like I'm thinking of hamburger patties right now, mm-hmm. um, like a meat in three, because you know, if you're going to get a meat in three, which I have a chapter like that in the book, you know, if you get that, you're going to get three vegetables and you're going to get a meat. So mm-hmm. if you have the hamburger patty, you know, with um, the fried onion rings one night, you could have it with mashed potatoes the next night. So I make in excess, um, uh, you know, and have that all together and then just mix and match throughout the week. So um, I think that that's a real important thing to do. Or you can make a whole lot of meatballs have and then freeze them. Just make a ton of meatballs, yes. freeze them in the freezer and then have them in, you know, just that with some spaghetti sauce or just that 
those meatballs and, and make it with um, noodles or homemade pasta or whatever you want to do and, and pesto, you change the whole thing, but you still have the base of the meat. So yes. knowing what you're going to do meat wise that week, you can add anything to it. You could just like bake asparagus or, um, or roast some broccoli, you know, side for that. And, you know, it's just knowing that protein. If you can get down, what protein do I want to have this week? And some special weeks I like to, um, freeze, you know, if I'm making a whole lot of stuff and, and like something's on sale at, at the store and I come home, I cook it, um, and then make some casseroles and have them in the freezer ready for weeks that are just so busy that I cannot yeah. manage. And thank goodness, because you have three freezers, you have room for the yes. extra casseroles. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And if you uh, don't, Stacey, you can always plan. Yeah. This has been so fun. And I know that people have been encouraged and everybody definitely go check out. I haven't said the title. Oh my goodness. Love Language of the South. Amazing, yep. amazing cookbook and memoir combined. Where can people find you? Um, look at Stacy Lynn Harris or in, on any social media platform that you use. Um, you know, so I'm on Instagram and Facebook mostly, but anywhere you want to go, you can find me on my website and sign up for my newsletter there. Um, and you'll yes. get free, you know, free, uh, recipes coming to your inbox. Yes. I'm on that list. I get some Yay! yumminess, yeah, yeah, <laughs> some good fun. inspiration. Thank you. Okay. Then I will put links for all that that you just said in the show notes. I'll put a link to your amazing new book and I, we're going to have to fun. do this again because it's always fun. I know. I cannot wait. Let's do this very soon. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much, Stacy. Thank you. And that's a wrap. Isn't Stacy the best? Thanks for listening, guys. Don't forget to leave a review on this episode for a chance to win the, um, your own copy of this amazingly gorgeous, delicious book. And also don't forget this entire month, every single day, check out solelyrested.com slash free, F-R-E-E. And that's it. Remember guys, it is easy to forget how blessed we are to live this life. So enjoy the simple everyday efforts. It's not easy, but it's a good life.